Hello, and welcome back to our continued discussion about carbohydrates. Just to start where we left off, we were talking about uh, this, that second level of intricacy in carbohydrates, that of the uh, disaccharides. Disaccharides, and ultimately what disaccharides are, are two separate monosaccharides, and it does matter what the identities of these are, as, as we'll be seeing in the future, um, with it, which uh, form a covalent bond uh, between two of their hydroxyls, as we see here here to, uh, give, uh, to, to give what is called an oxygen bridge covalent uh, uh, connection right here to give a representative disaccharide. Now, uh, the, the, the nature of this covalent linkage, this glycosidic bond, also known as, uh, as an oxygen bridge, is going to be important because there's going to be three, if not four, types of these oxygen bridges, which we're going to have to become familiar with. And we'll start learning those terms uh, as we start become uh, familiar with uh, with these uh, uh, disaccharides. So, importantly, in a disaccharide, if we uh, we uh, look at if we look at this, uh, that a glycosidic bond locks the anomeric center of the leftmost monosaccharide in the pair. So if we look over at the molecule on, on the right, we have this glycosidic bond or this uh, anomeric center right here. Usually an anomeric center can open up, open and close. When it opens, it reveals an aldehyde. When it closes, we're in a hemiacetal. But when it is locked in a, uh, a linkage such as this, we uh, get a full acetal, a full acetal linkage. And we can trace that full acetal as C-O-C-O-C. -O -O -C. And here we go. Carbon, oxygen, carbon, oxygen, carbon. That is diagnostic connectivity for a full acetal. Um, what we're going to be doing here now is we're going to be moving actually this very specific uh, 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 disaccharide right here. We're going to be moving into uh, uh, an area where we're going to be talking about being able to recognize certain uh, uh, disaccharides. This particular one we're going to be moving into the next slide with. So now we find ourselves in a similar situation as last time, where we, if you notice this title, three representative disaccharides. That word representative ultimately means, uh, can you pick uh, one of these structures out of a lineup? We did this with the monosaccharides, being able to tell glucose from galactose, from fructose, from ribose, etc. We're going to do the same uh, with uh, disaccharides, except there's going to be three representative ones of the hundreds we could possibly uh, put out there. When I say recognize, it's only recognize something like this. I would never have you draw something like this on paper. So our first uh, representative disaccharide is known as maltose. Maltose is an intermediate uh, in the digestion of dietary starches, an intermediate. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, the, the way maltose is connected in a disaccharide is through two glucose monomers two glucose uh, of this, so it's the same monosaccharide. Now notice in here that we have, uh, it's written almost uh, redundantly that D-glucose is D. We don't care about D anymore because it's always D. What's very important, however, in both of these is one of the anomeric dispositions of, uh, of that uh, uh, of the monosaccharide, and it's always the monosaccharide on the left here. Notice this monosaccharide has hydroxyl down. Hydroxyl down means alpha. That is very important. So uh, if we look at the other anomeric center, this one is up. This one is up, uh, up on this Haworth projection means beta. That means nothing at all, because as we know, this anomeric center can open up and close again, up or down, alpha or beta. So none of that matters. What is crucial, however, is this alpha. See, I'm, I'm, uh, the alpha on the monosaccharide on the left is very crucial, because what that, that can do now is it allows for these two hydroxyls to sort of uh, come into contact with each other and spit out 
H-O-H. If we spit out H-O-H, that is over here on the right-hand side, water. And what is left is our glycosidic bond. So here we have a structure of, it's called maltose. Maltose has a diagnostic way it's expressed. Notice in these disaccharides, they're always in a Haworth projection. Uh, bo both of the, uh, the monosaccharides that make it up, that will always be the case, a Haworth projection. And uh, in this case, it's two, uh, two glucose monomers. And let's take a closer look now at the, the nature of that that glycosidic bond. If you look uh, up uh, towards the top of the left of the right hand structure here, we have a name for this glycosidic bond, or if you like, glycosidic linkage. It is an alpha one arrow four, called an alpha one four glycosidic linkage. And let's explore what that actually means. Let's look first at the alpha terminology. Alpha is the anomeric disposition of the, uh, the monosaccharide on the left. In this case, it is down. So that's where alpha comes from. In the parentheses, one arrow four, what that means is we have uh, our one, the one carbon on the molecule on the left, happens to be the anomeric carbon, and the, connected to the four carbon of the, of the molecule or the monosaccharide on the right, one to four. That is the, that glycosidic linkage, that oxygen bridge is clicking or linking between one and four. So therefore, this is an alpha one four glycosidic bond. Um, so uh, I'll always only show you uh, an alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond in this manner. And if we look at this, uh, it's the only one of our three representative monosaccharides that is going to be in the shape of a V. I know I do this stupid thing sometimes where, you know, it's, it's V is isopropyl. Well, in this case, V is going to be the uh, alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkage. Uh, you know, you don't have to use that. If it, it always worked for me, but you don't have to. Um, other ones are not going to look like a V. They're going to have other structures associated with them. So um, again, the definition of maltose is two glucose monomers. It's this two of the same glucose monosaccharide connected by an alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond. So we'll move on now to the next of our three representative monos or disaccharides. The next one is, uh, is known as lactose. Lactose is our second representative disaccharide. Uh, its uh, nutritional function is it is the sugar in milk. Lactose, milk sugar, is actually a disaccharide. Now, the term lactose should be somewhat uh, uh, familiar because remember, one of our monosaccharides that we had to remember, the or five representative monosaccharides, was galactose galactose. And in this case, uh, we, uh, we, we have that galactose itself is not milk sugar, but rather the disaccharide, which we're going to make with, with galactose, is going to be milk sugar. In any event, um, uh, a lactose is a galactose and a glucose monomer. But so we, here we have a galactose and a glucose. Notice that they are uh, that they are not connected at this point. Um, but but it's important that the galactose is on the left in this in this case, and the glucose is on the right. If they were switched up, it would be a different disaccharide. It would be different. Now, similar to maltose, let's uh, let's uh, let's look at some of this uh, action down uh, down on here. Um, the D in galactose is not important. The D in glucose is similarly not important. The only thing that is important is the anomeric disposition of the, hyd of the, the, the hydroxyl of the, mo of the monosaccharide on the left. Look, it goes upwards. Upwards means it is beta. Beta. Now, in this case, on the monosaccharide on the right here, glucose, this uh, anomeric center they've just drawn as beta, it doesn't matter. Remember, this one here can uh, open and close, become alpha or beta, beta uh, at will because it is a hemiacetal. So in this care, in this case, that beta does not matter uh, uh, whatsoever. 
It is what, what, what is most important, as I said before, is this, the beta on the monosaccharide on the left. So notice if this, uh, this uh, uh, hydroxyl is up, beta, in this galactose, in this case, um, what does that give us? Well, it, it uh, brings it into uh, sort of uh, contact with the uh, four hydroxyl on the monosaccharide on the right. In this case, it is a glucose. It's always a galactose and a glucose uh, in, that, in, in that order. So uh, what happens here? Well, again, we are uh, presented with HOH. So we get that water which spits out over on the right hand side here. There's water spitting out. And what is left? Well, uh, I'll clean this up a little bit here. Whoops. We'll take a look at that. Here we have uh, the four carbon on glucose is always down. Remember, it stays straight down. The beta on this anomeric center is always up. So the way they are connected now, what's left over, let's look over on the right-hand side here. This glycosidic bond is like a slant or something like that, or a, a slant upwards. Uh, that is different than the alpha-1,4 linkage, which we saw before, which was like a V. This one looks different. And when they come together, we form that disaccharide lactose. So now we have lactose. Could you pick lactose, which we see here, uh, apart from uh, the maltose, which we saw before. I'll bet you could because of the, the, the way it's put together. We'll look at a, a slide of that com coming up uh, uh, in, in just a few moments. But let's look at the glycosidic bond, the name of that glycosidic bond itself. Remember, in maltose, we had an alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond. Here in lactose, we have a beta beta 114 uh, glycosidic bond. And let's see if we can tease that apart uh, here. So let's look first at beta. Why is it beta? Well, it's always the anomeric disposition of the monosaccharide on the, uh, uh, on the left here, and there it is. It is upwards compared to this down, uh, down hydrogen. So upwards uh, for that anomeric oxygen is indeed beta. So there's where the beta term comes from. One arrow four, what does that mean? Well, again, uh, we, have, we are connecting those two monosaccharides, starting at the one carbon of the monosaccharide on the left with the four carbon of the monosaccharide on the right. So there we have a beta one four, different than an alpha one four. Alpha one four was our V, beta one four is sort of our, our slant or how, however you wanna look at that. Um, is how we uh, look at that. So we've looked at two of our three representative disaccharides, and now we're gonna fold in the third one. This looks vastly different than the other two. These will actually be, I promise you, easy to pick out from a lineup as we move along. So let's see. Here's our third one. Our third one is uh, called <clears throat> sucrose. Sucrose is uh, very familiar to us. If we, you had coffee with sugar in it this morning, uh, the, you, you ingested some sucrose. It is table sugar. Table sugar is what we put in our sugar bowls or that sort of thing. Um, and in this case, uh, the disaccharide is a glucose monomer and a fructose monomer. Remember, those were two of our five representative disaccharides with a nutritional, I'm sorry, monosaccharides with a nutritional role. That nutritional role uh, in, in this case, well, fructose was fruit sugar, glucose was a major energy source in animal systems, so that uh, we're gonna put those together in a disaccharide through a glycosidic linkage. So in this case, Let's look at uh, over on the, uh, the left-hand side, we have beta fructose, beta fructose, and we have alpha glucose. Now, in this case, it is very important that the glucose has an alpha disposition, downward disposition of its uh, hydroxyl, and fructose has an upward disposition of its hydroxyl. That is crucial because we have to put those two hydroxyls into proximity with one another, and as before, what do we see here? It's going to spit out H 
OH. HOH, well, look at that over on the right-hand side. There's water. And what's left over if we spit out water from here? Well, uh, in this case, if you look over at the molecule on the right, we get a glycosidic bond, but it looks really strange. This is to your benefit, of course, because it looks very different than any of the other ones that we've seen before. Sucrose, table sugar, has as its components, let's clean this up a little bit, a glucose, there is glucose, and a fructose monomer down on the bottom. There's fructose. And connected by a really uh, a different type of glycosidic bond, alpha-1 to beta-2. Now, notice we have two uh, Greek symbols in here. That is because uh, it is very important because we have a directionality because these uh, these uh, uh, anomeric centers are both anomeric centers are participating in the glycosidic bond. If they're both participating in the glycosidic bond, they are both locked. Both now can never be uh, can never be opened. Again, these monosaccharides uh, that make up the disaccharide here are locked in place, so they can never open up until such a time as the disaccharide, or rather the, the, the glycosidic bond which is connecting them uh, is, uh, is broken. So we're going to see some, uh, some connotations of that uh, as we move along. Let me clean it up here again. And so let's look at the nature of this uh, glycosidic bond right here. Uh, the nature of the glycosidic bond, we have alpha-1. Well, we have the one carbon here on glucose, alpha, is pointed downward. So that is an alpha disposition of that what once was that hydroxyl to beta-2. Well, that is on the other monosaccharide in the bottom here. There is that two carbon, and it is point, pointed upwards from what once was that hydroxyl. That is a beta, and it happens to be the two carbon on that fructose. So we have an alpha-1 to beta-2 linkage. So that, that alpha-1 to beta-2 is not a V. It is not a slant. It is sort of a straight line, up and down, you could say, if you, if you want to look at it that way. So there would be another way yet to uh, identify these, uh, these different linkages. <clears throat> also, with re respect to our, uh, the, the, the look of this, this is the only one, this looks very different than the other two representative disaccharides. This, uh, these are right on top of each other. And this is done in order to preserve the, 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 the sanctity, if you will, of the Haworth projection. We always put a Haworth projection the same way. In order to uh, maintain that, uh, we have to put these on top of each other. So it's the only one disaccharide that looks like a short stack of pancakes, if you want to look, look at it uh, uh, in, in that fashion. So let's, uh, let's put all these together. Here it is. Here's our three uh, representative disaccharides. Could, with just a little bit of studying, we can quite easily uh, be able to uh, discern one of these from the other, as long as we know the names of these. Oh, look over here on the right-hand side. That is a V. It's a V. That must mean this was maltose. V equals maltose. What's the, uh, what's the name of this glycosidic bond? Well, the V is an alpha-1,4. Um, over, uh, over here on the left, uh, we see that slant right there, that glycosidic bond. That was representative of a beta-1,4 glycosidic linkage and specific for, uh, uh, specific for uh, lactose. The, uh, the other one, uh, sucrose and maltose, we put uh, in here that, that sucrose that we see here was an alpha-1 to beta-2 uh, glycosidic bond. And again, sucrose being our short stack of pancakes, we're able to, uh, to rep uh, recognize that quite easily uh, as well. Let's go back to that uh, question we uh, had from the last lecture about uh, 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 would the disaccharides give a positive or a negative Benedict's test? Now remember, a Benedict's test uh, test positive if we have an aldehyde present. And what we had looked at last time was the fact that while this anomeric, let's look over at the molecule on the left-hand side, this anomeric center is locked because it is in a full acetal locked in a glycosidic bond. 
this anomeric center can reopen. It can reopen because it is a hemiacetal. A hemiacetal, C-O-C-O-H, is labile. So in this case, uh, with lactose anyways, we would get a positive Benedex test because this, uh, let's see, this anomeric center would open up, would be able to open up and flash its aldehyde. When it flashes its aldehyde, the Benedict's uh, reagent will flash a positive test. Looking over at the molecule on the far right, maltose. We see maltose right here. Again, if we look at the, uh, at the anomeric center on the left, that one is locked in a glycosidic bond. That anomeric center will remain closed until such a time as this glycosidic bond is broken. However, we have another anomeric center over there, and this is the one we actually looked at last time, right here. This one is labile. Why? Because we have that, uh, that, that uh, hemiacetal linkage, COCOH, and when we have that COCOH, that means it can open up, and when it opens up, it flashes its aldehyde, and the Benedix reagent latches onto that, and we get a positive Benedix test, because in both cases, now the rightmost anomeric center is labile. So if I asked, uh, could, uh, could uh, uh, lactose or, or maltose, uh, get, get what sort of Benedict's test would it give? They both give positive Benedict's tests. Now let's look at sucrose here in the middle. Sucrose, where we have now notice both anomeric centers. Both of them are participating in that uh, glycosidic bond. So both of them are locked until such a time as that glycosidic bond is broken, uh, they will remain locked. Thus, if neither of them can open and flash their aldehyde, we, we're going to get with sucrose always a negative Benedict's test because both anomeric centers are locked. Okay, the final level of intricacy for uh, carbohydrates is polysaccharides. Polysaccharides, by definition, are polymers of monosaccharides. We could have thought of the disaccharides as, as a polymer of a, of a monosaccharide, but it's only two of them, so it's not really a polymer. We think of a polymer, we're thinking, you know, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 units long, and that is indeed what we're looking at when we think about polysaccharides. With so many possibilities, uh, you know, of, of monosaccharides to go into making up a polysaccharide. Here's a, you know, just just a picture of one right here, a very small uh, uh, com component of, of a polysaccharide. You can see it's a polymer. We have the same monomer throughout. So because the, the such a diverse number of possibilities uh, for uh, these polysaccharides, what we're going to be ultimately doing is we're only going to be considering uh, polymers of only one monosaccharide, one type of monosaccharide, and that is glucose. It just makes things easier. It gives us a taste of what polysaccharides are without having, without having to go into the extreme uh, diversity of, of the types of polysaccharides we can make. And indeed, on this uh, structure right here that I've drawn, uh, these are all glucose. These are all glucose monomers right here. And we're gonna see that uh, th uh, throughout the process. And so, um, now, polysaccharides consist of covalent polymers of, of cyclic monosaccharides. Remember, they're always cyclic, and they're always going to be shown in a Haworth projection, and they're always connected by, just like in disaccharides, those glycosidic bonds, glycosidic bonds. Oh, look, here's a V one. I wonder what that one is. That was the alpha-1-4 linkage in this case. So I'm just going to try going back to stuff we've already learned and or gone over, so it's, it's showed that it's, it's not that difficult to start to recognize these things. Um, but... Uh, to, to sort of set the stage for this, we're going to look at 
three types of polymers of glucose, three types of, of polysaccharide glucose that we'll cover. The first one are dietary starches. These are starches that we ingest uh, in, in, in our diets. We're going to look at uh, uh, the nature of those. We're going to move on to glycogen. The, the glycogen is how uh, animal systems store, uh, store excess glucose. And last, we're going to look at a kind of a weird polymer, but very ubiquitous. That means, uh, that means plentiful. Uh, a polymer of glucose that is known as cellulose. So we're going to look at these three. The first polymer of glucose we're going to be looking at, as, as I said before, are dietary starches. And there's two types of dietary starches we're going to be uh, uh, associating ourselves with. That would be called amylose and amylopectin. Both are dietary starches. When we eat starchy foods, uh, both of these are going into our system and we're, 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 we're digesting them and, and utilizing the glucose, which is locked into the, uh, these, these polymers of uh, polymers of glucose, um, and they differ in with one type of structural feature. Now, amylose is a linear polymer. It's all one line, a linear polymer of glucose, and there's only one way that, that this is expressed, uh, and that is, if we, if we look at this, uh, at this model right here, uh, it is all in one line. How could we make a linear polymer of glucose? Well, uh, we have uh, glucose monomers here, shown, shown here, and they're all connected by alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds. Alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds. Again, look at that V. V we see right there. That was diagnostic alpha-1,4 linkage. So we have all of these alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds. Our second one Amylopectin, our dietary starch, um, are considered branched polymers of glucose. Um, most of the, the, the connectivity, the glycosidic bonds in here um, are these alpha-1,4 linkages. See these Vs right here. These are alpha-1,4 linkages, but every so often we get a branch point. And this brings into uh, play a new, a fourth and final, I promise, type of glycosidic bond known as an alpha-1,6 linkage or an alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. That's what we see right here. What we see right here, let me uh, maybe uh, clean this up just a little bit. This alpha-1,6 glycosidic linkage is, is, is alpha, so that's an alpha, it's a little hard to see there, but that first one is an alpha, that means hydroxyl down. So here, let's look at this, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put in yellow here, this monosaccharide right here, this glucose, it's, uh, it's hydroxyl was pointed downward, downward, we saw that. So that means alpha. So there's alpha, and just like we saw alpha on these monosaccharides right here, pointing downward. So we have that alpha uh, piece to us. Now we're going to be looking at the, the rest of this. Alpha different here, 1, 6. Alpha 1, 6. So what does that mean? Well, the numbers before we saw were, were to show what carbons are attached from one monosaccharide to the next. So let's look very closely at this highlighted monosaccharide up here. That is the one carbon right there. And it is attached to, through a glycosidic bond, the six carbon. Remember the C6 flag on all of these monomers? I called it the C6 flag. Well, that hydroxyl in the C6 flag is now participating in this glycosidic bond. So it's a so because we're attached to that six carbon there, it is an alpha between one carbon, the one carbon on one, and the six carbon on the other, an alpha-1,6 glycosidic bond. Now, uh, in biochemistry, the, the uh, is very intricate, and it's very difficult to draw all of these monomers of glucose all at once, uh, or draw over and over and over. Uh, so frequently in, in biochemistry, we resort or revert to the level of the cartoon to express these. So um, we 
what I have here, what I've drawn here on the bottom here that just appeared, if you look very closely, what these are, these aren't beads. If you look very closely, they're actually little teeny hexagons, little hexagons, uh, which, which uh, represent the six-membered ring of, uh, of glucose. So these hexagons, you know, we could over here on amylose, we could make, you know, this is a hexagon right here. This is also a hexagon right here. And they're sort of connected. These hexagons are connected in these glycosidic, with these glycosidic bonds. So what that is expressed in a cartoon form are little teeny hexagons connected at their, uh, at one of their edges. So that's how these are, are connected. Amylose now in this case would be just one long line of these, uh, of these hexagons connected tip to tip. Amylopectin would be mostly lines of, of amylose connected tip to tip, except every once in a while we encounter branching points. Very rarely do we do, we encounter these branching points, uh, but that makes it, it's not amylose anymore, it makes it amylopectin. If I showed you either the uh, two structures on the top here or the two renditions in cartoon on the bottom, uh, you'd be able to tell me which one is representative of amylose, which one is representative of amylopectin, because amylopectin is the one with branching and amylose is the one that does not have any branching. Our second type of polysaccharide, that polymer of glucose, is known as glycogen. As I referred to before, or I alluded to before, glycogen is a storage polymer for glucose in animal systems, uh, you know, including, including ourselves. Um, and if we have too much glucose within our body due to dietary starches or, or sugars we're intaking, and we can't use it all, all at once, we can store that away. And when we store that away, we have to put, put these glucose monomers into something and we store them as glycogen. Now, the structure of glycogen is similar to amylopectin. If you look down here uh, at the structure that we see here, it's similar to amylopectin. You see these little tiny hexagons connected tip to tip, but we have, what's different about it is, an, is that it has a higher degree of branching. We have more branches in, in glycogen and less branches in, uh, in, in amylopectin. So if I offered you uh, two of these uh, sorts of things, how would we, uh, 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 you know, the difference between a representation of amylopectin and a representation of glycogen. Glycogen would be the one that has the greater degree of branching. Um, glycogen itself, once it's made, has to be stored. We have to have a cupboard for it within our systems. It's primarily stored in the liver, that is the primary storage of glycogen, with some stored in skeletal muscle to be used uh, immediately if we require uh, a quick form of stored energy. So some of it is indeed stored within our skeletal muscle. Let's uh, look down at the bottom here. I'll clean the slide up here. It looks sort of messy now that the actual picture is gone. Um, so uh, again, you know, the, the big question on a test or a quiz or an exam, here are some representations of these polymers of glucose. Which one is glycogen? Which one is amylopectin? Which one is amylose? So we'd, uh, we'd be able to tell, uh, you know, that, that we would have, uh, you know, uh, for instance, this uh, one is uh, with ju just a, a linear expression here is amylose. The one with, uh, with a slower degree of branching would be amylopectin. Both of these are examples of dietary starches. This last one has a higher degree of branching. Therefore, it would be, uh, it we would consider that, oh, that's glycogen because it has a higher degree of branching. So these are the sorts of things that we can, uh, we, we can expect as we move along. It's interesting much of the time. Nature seems a lot of the time to take the long way around a process. And an example here, and you know, I mean, this is obviously necessary, but it's just something that, that occurs to me. If we look at amylopectin over here, that was one of our dietary starches. This is what we intake into our systems <clears throat> when uh, we uh, when we eat uh, starchy foods. That amylopectin 
uh, all uh, has to be completely converted into glucose in order for us to be able to extract the energy in glucose. It's important to recognize that uh, when we have glucose in a polymeric form, uh, uh, as it, for, such as this dietary starch, we cannot access the uh, energy potential in the glucose monomers. All of those glycosidic bonds throughout this amylopectin have to be broken down. That happens in the digestive process to form glucose monomers. So here we have a whole lot of free glucose in our system. And now if these glucose molecules are delivered to cells, we can extract the chemical energy from them and use it for our own purposes. More on that in a, in a future chapter. However, we can only use so much of, of, uh, of this glucose uh, at once. So, you know, if you're like me, you don't, uh, you know, I, I won't just eat a, a slice of bread, I'll eat a loaf of bread because I'm hungry. Um, all of that uh, amylo, amylose and amylose, amylopectin is eventually going to get converted down into glucose monomers from that entire loaf of bread that Flemmer has uh, uh, consumed. I'm not going to be able to use all of that glucose at once, so I'll use some of it. Uh, but the vast majority of, of that those glucose monomers is then reattached, restitched together using glycosidic bonds into the form of glycogen. And we use that as our, our rainy day supply of food. Of, Throat, you know, of stores, we put that into our skeletal muscle or into um, primarily into the liver to be used um, uh, down the road. Our final uh, representation of a polymer of glucose is uh, is called cellulose. Now, cellulose is very different uh, uh, from, from uh, the dietary starches or glycogen, uh, where we saw that connectivity between uh, our dietary starches are turned into, into glycogen, we go back and forth and that sort of thing. Cellulose is different. We could call it, if we had to put a term to it, the major structural scaffolding in plants. There's a fancy way of saying wood. Is, is basically wood. Um, so if you think of all the forests in the world, they're all made of, of wood. And thus, if we had to, uh, you know, that's a, a very abundant molecule. The most abundant organic molecule on earth it would, could be very easily argued to be cellulose, the most abundant organic molecule on earth, because think of all the vast forests made of wood. Um, and uh, this, this cellulose, it does not play a nutritional role. Uh, it, it actually provides uh, a, let me clean this up, it actually provides a uh, structural role a structural role in plants, you know, the, 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 the sturdiness, if you will, of, of wood in trees helps them to grow to great heights. So it plays more of a structural role. Interestingly now, cellulose, and we have a picture of it uh, uh, down here on the bottom, it's still glucose, it's polymers of glucose. So really we have, uh, what we have here is stored away a vast amount of energy, which if converted into its glucose monomers could literally feed the world. However, so here we have, these are glucose monomers, glucose monomers. So wouldn't it be great if we could take all the glucose in, in wood and, and, uh, and be able to extract energy from it? The problem, the problem with uh, extracting the, or uh, breaking down the, uh, the cellulose into uh, di uh, dietary glucose, if you will, is the fact that we have these beta-1,4 glycosidic linkages. And when we have beta-1,4 glycosidic linkages between two molecules of glucose, most animals cannot break those. They cannot break those glycosidic bonds. It requires an enzyme known as cellulase. Cellulase breaks down cellulose. So it's the only enzyme that can break down those beta-1,4 glycosidic bonds in cellulose in order to access the glucose within. So really the question here is wouldn't that be something to be able to access all of the glucose in in uh, in, in in plants? So, for for instance, uh, we do have some exceptions to this, and ex exceptions would be in ruminating animals like cows or or that sort of thing, cows uh, or goats or that sort of thing. They sit around and eat plants all day, and they're able to uh, express the. Uh, 
to, to, to be able to break apart those beta-1-4 bonds in this cellulose, because there's cellulose in grass, there's cellulose in trees, um, but ruminating animals are able to do it, as well as other, other animals, like, for instance, termites. Are able, obviously, termites live in wood. They eat it. We can't do that. We cannot do that. Um, and we'll look at the reason for that, uh, or why termites and ruminating animals like cows can break those uh, beta-1-4 linkages. But let's just think about this. Let's put, let's put these side to side. And let's put in one pile, we're gonna have a bunch of glucose on the next slide. And in another pile, we're gonna have a bunch of glucose. Let's see. One type of glucose that we have here uh, amylose, that's a polymer of glucose. That's a baked potato. Wow, that looks really, uh, that looks really appetizing. If we ate our baked potato here, we would be able to extract their, uh, digest the amylose within and be able to uh, extract those, uh, those, those, those glucose monomers out of there and it's nutritional. However, cellulose, <coughs> what do we have for a bunch of cellulose? Here's another pile of glucose. Pile of wood. It'd be like going out to the wood pile and gnawing on a log for a while. We can't do that. <clears throat> so it would be like eating sawdust. You know, we can't do that. Yeah, we'll eat sawdust and out it comes pretty quickly, uh, unchanged for the most part, but we can't do that. So it's very interesting. In both cases here, we have an abundance of glucose, but only in this case, amylose, can we, can we extract it, or amylopectin, cellulose, we cannot, unless, as we said before, <clears throat> we, uh, we have special conditions, ruminating animals or termites. Let's look at termites uh, uh, as, uh, as an example here. How do termites digest the cellulose in the wood they're eating? Animals can't do that typically. Well, they, as, uh, as animals, uh, uh, cannot produce the necessary enzymes, cellulase, which breaks down those beta-1-4 linkages in cellulose to access the glucose. However, what they do is they have an, a symbiotic relationship with certain protozoa, and this is the same, uh, in the same case as in ruminating animals, in the rumen of ruminating animals, like cows, they have areas in their stomach which are uh, which allow these certain protozoa to exist. As with uh, as in uh, uh, termites, the protozoa do are able to uh, to make this enzyme, and so <clears throat> any cellulose that comes into the gut is broken down into glucose by these. Uh, by these protozoa and the huge excess of glucose that they are able to break down, the animals which uh, house these uh, protozoa are able to uh, uh, make use of that, uh, of that glucose. Okay, well, we made it through the first uh, unit of study in the biochemistry. Uh, a component of the course, that of carbohydrates, and we're going to move into the next one. Uh, we're going to look at unit eight. Unit eight um, is going to be called the lipids unit of study. Lipids uh, can typically uh, be, uh, be known, are typically more colloquially known as fats. Uh, so we're going to look at lipids and their functions in biochemical systems. So <clears throat> we're going to look at certain types of lipids, three types of lipids specifically, and look at their functions. First and foremost, lipids, or rather fats, provide uh, an, an energy source, an energy source and an energy storage system within animal biological systems. Also, something very different for lipids, they provide a structural role. They provide ver the entire structural uh, capacity of cell membranes. Cell membranes are made up uh, almost exclusively of lipid structure or fatty structure. And lastly, we'll take a, a little bit of a, a detour and look at a lipid-based type of structure. Uh, these are steroid structures, many of which uh, are, are certain important hormones that, that we need for, uh, for the functioning of our, our biological systems. At their most basic, lipids are uh, are constructed of uh, building blocks known as fatty acids. We've looked at fatty acids before when we 
uh, to when we uh, looked at triglycerides and the, and, and the hydrolysis of, of triglycerides to form soap. Fatty acids uh, are essentially carboxylic acids, as we see here. That's a carboxylic acid head group with uh, a very, very long uh, hydrocarbon tail associated with it. So uh, fatty acids can be broken down into uh, two types of structures or two types that we'll be uh, looking at. The first would be uh, considered a uh, saturated fatty acid. As we know, the term saturation means all carbon-carbon single bonds. And you can see throughout this fatty acid structure that all of the carbon-carbon bonds are single bonded. Thus, we have a saturated fatty acid. Uh, here's a uh, representative fatty acid, uh, saturated fatty acid right here. Uh, it's known as, as stearic acid. I would never have you memorize this particular structure with that particular name. However, uh, this is, you know, these do have uh, uh, some colloquial names attached to them, but uh, we're only going to be probably considering one type of fatty acid to be, uh, to be something that, that you're going to remember within your lexicon. The other... Uh, type of fatty acid that we're going to be looking at are unsaturated fatty acids. Unsaturated fatty acids have at least one carbon-carbon double bond within there. It's never a carbon-carbon triple bond. It's always a carbon-carbon double bond. Uh, in this example, oleic acid, this is the uh, fatty acid that is the primary uh, in, uh, uh, molecule or uh, ingredient molecule in olive oil, uh, is 18 carbons long, just happens to be, and it has one uh, one unsaturation right between these two carbons. Now, uh, notice that that these unsaturations could be between other two carbons or that, that sort of thing. It doesn't have to be at this particular one, but the, again, these are just representative uh, fatty acids that, that we, we see here. Importantly, and if you remember back in the uh, in the carbohydrates uh, unit of study, when we were talking about monosaccharides, that only D monosaccharides are used and uh, are used and produced in nature. Well, nature is very fickle in many other ways too. In, the, in this case, when we do have unsaturated fatty acids, in nature, all unsaturated fatty acids have cis double bonds to them. No trans double bonds. Again, a, a very uh, a one sidedness, a lopsidedness in nature. Here's another view of some fatty acids written in line drawing or quasi line drawing. If you look at the uh, structure towards the top, this is a representative saturated fatty acid, which we see here. Um, the uh, only difference that we can make in this saturated fatty acid is that we could add on more carbons. Um, you know, this is, uh, the, this is the stearic acid from the previous slide. If we took away a couple carbons, added a, a couple carbons, it would be a different molecule. But there's not a whole lot that we can do with saturated fatty acids. They're not that interesting. In fact, saturated and unsaturated fatty acids play widely different roles, as we'll see, uh, in, in biological functions. So the, the real interesting piece are the unsaturated fatty acids. And here are some representative ones set in line drawing. Note the, uh, the, the cis uh, contour of all of the double bonds. Notice they can have uh, multiple double bonds, a single double bond. But as long as there's one carbon-carbon double bond in there, it is considered an unsaturated fatty acid. Now, the way that these molecules uh, uh, situate themselves uh, is kind of interesting based upon the kinks put in uh, by, by these uh, by, by these cis double bonds. So, and we'll, look, we'll take a look at that in a little bit more detail, but look at these three fatty acids, unsaturated fatty acids, as they actually uh, uh, associate themselves uh, uh, normally. So notice that the cis double bonds here will, uh, will put a, a, a sharp kink or a number of kinks in the structure. So it is not sort of a, a, a straight structure or anything. This forces some kinking into the structure, which is going to have some, uh, have some importance when we start looking at uh, the, the melting points of these, uh, of these uh, compounds. 
Let's take a look at this uh, plot now in which on the y-axis we have melting point temperature and on the x-axis uh, are the number of carbon atoms in the fatty acid. Now you'll know if we talk about saturated fatty acids as we increase in carbon number say from 4 to 6 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 carbons, and so on, the melting point of the compound uh, increases. And that makes sense because the more carbons it is, the higher molar mass it is, and boiling and melting points track increasing with, uh, with greater molar mass. So this is not surprising. But let's focus in on this uh, 18 uh, carbon variety here, um, 18 carbons long, whether it's a saturated or an unsaturated fatty acid, we would assume that it would have about the same uh, about the same melting point because it has about the same molar mass and all of the functional groups that carboxylic acid on it are identical. But in fact, what we see here is that with uh, with an 18 carbon fa fatty acid, if it is saturated up here, we have a melting point of about 70 degrees Celsius. 70 degrees Celsius. So anything above this uh, uh, above this dotted line right here is a solid at room temperature. So in this case, stearic acid would be a solid at room temperature, 18 carbons long. Let's put let's introduce one kink into it, like from the other from the uh, the slide previously, and now look at where that melting point is significantly lower below this uh, dotted line. So this would be liquid at room temperature, and indeed oleic acid is liquid at room temperature. It's about 10 degrees Celsius is its melting point. As we continually add additional unsaturations, cis double bonds into it, we get uh, lower and lower uh, uh, melting points. So we go from one double bond to two double bonds to three double bonds, um, but they all weigh, have the same molar mass. They weigh about the same. So what exactly is going on here with this huge disparity in melting points? It really has to do with the way these molecules uh, come together. When we think of going from the liquid phase to the solid phase, we are uh, we are taking the uh, random molecules in the liquid and are putting them into a uh, a pattern, a lattice, a specific lattice. And there's some some uh, there there is is some pattern to it. So let's look at these these structures. When we think of a representative saturated fatty acid over here on the left hand side, uh, it's all carbon carbon single bonds. So that in solution or in the melted uh, the, the the liquid phase, it pretty much holds a rod like stature that that we see right here. It's sort of very straight, very uh, uh, very uh, the same sort of thing over and over. Now uh, this is what but uh, we would uh, prefer to have is what we call a favorable packing potential, meaning favorable to go from the liquid phase into the solid phase. These rods are all about the same size and they're consistent so that they are going to uh, to form, uh, or, or rather form into the, the crystalline lattice much more readily uh, than, uh, than, than, uh, than others that, that we'll be taking, uh, taking a look at. Now, it's sort of like uh, if we compare this to a representative unsaturated fatty acid in which we have a number of, uh, of, of double bonds, and these are cis double bonds, each of these double bonds introduces a kink into the structure. So this, uh, if we had this as our representative molecule, it would be very difficult uh, to put this into a, uh, a, a, a favorable packing, packing uh, packed into a structure. So this has an unfavorable packing potential. A good analogy might be that the, the molecules over, the molecule of, of the saturated fatty acid over here on the right is sort of like uniform chopped, chopped wood, like logs or something. And we can take these logs and pile them high into a wood pile. And that wood pile, because of the uniform logs will indeed uh, will be able to, to 
to pile that very neatly together to a very uh, to very high height. However, if our logs were very gnarled and bent and that sort of thing, like we see in, in this case right here, we could try to start packing them and stacking them into a wood pile, but the wood pile would not get very high until it all just fell over because it didn't have a very good packing potential of those logs uh, into the pile. The same can be said for packing potential going from a liquid where we get these random associations of, of, the, of, the, of the compounds, molecules, into a crystalline lattice, into an ordered lattice. Much easier to go into an ordered lattice if we have ordered uniform molecules such as this, that'll occur at a lower temperature. If we have gnarled and uh, uh, sort of offset molecules such as this, that is going to uh, uh, stay liquid much longer and a lot of energy will have to be taken taken out of it before it grudgingly uh, forms into into a solid so this is why uh, saturated fatty acids saturated fatty acids uh, tend to have a uh, a very favorable packing potential meaning higher uh, higher melting points unsaturated fatty acids tend to have an unfavorable packing potential and they tend to have lower melting points in, in this case and that's exactly what we saw in the preceding uh, plot. Another feature which uh, sort of gives a heightened importance to unsaturated fatty acids as opposed to saturated fatty acids is uh, the need for a dietary intake of what is called essential fatty acids. Now, most animal biological systems can synthesize fats. Uh, indeed, that is good. That is going to be, we're going to be looking at that down the road for use of our extra energy within our body. We can synthesize and, and store as fats. However, um, most most unsaturated fatty acids or important unsaturated fatty acids we are not able to synthesize uh, uh, within our bodies and thus we must have a a dietary intake of these because we re require a dietary intake of some of these essential fat of, of these fatty acids these unsaturated fatty acids they're known as essential we must have a dietary intake of them to look at a few representative ones, uh, here we have uh, three important uh, essential fatty acids that cannot be produced within our, with, with, by our biological processes. Alpha-linolenic acid, linoleic acid, arachidonic acid are all crucially important to have dietary intakes of them because they act as, as feedstock, as starting materials in the synthesis of uh, other more complex molecules, many of which we'll be looking at later in this chapter. So there are others, these are three representative ones, but there are other ones, uh, other essential fatty acids uh, out there. Um, of particular importance is this, uh, this bottom one right here, arachidonic acid, which will be uh, see as a precursor for many other uh, uh, more complex hormone systems, diverse hormone systems, all using this particular uh, unsaturated fatty acid as its precursor. One interesting uh, uh, side note, if you will, take a look at these uh, UPAC names of these fatty acids, of these unsaturated fatty acids. These are just so simply uh, astounding and, and, and complex, there is no way I would ever have you uh, we would, or, or introduce a system of UPAC nomenclature for these systems uh, <clears throat> because it, the UPAC nomenclature simply gets far too complex. One common way or one common uh, method you might have uh, uh, seen before in, uh, in, in recognizing these, uh, uh, these essential fatty acids would be by what is called the omega terminology. Remember, if you probably heard uh, omega-3 or omega-6 fatty acids are supposed to be very good for you and you can buy supplements for these and it's very important to have a dietary intake of them. Um, most omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are essential 
fatty acids, virtually all of them. Now notice uh, uh, frequently uh, this, uh, this term omega is given as the Greek, uh, 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 the, the Greek omega right here. We have omega-3, omega-6. You can sort of slip into that, uh, that Greek uh, terminology. Um, but it turns out that this uh, omega nomenclature uh, is a specific uh, method of counting carbons. If we look down at the molecule on the bottom, um, in UPAC, uh, if we were to even attempt this, naming this molecule by way of UPAC nomenclature, we would have to, here's the, uh, the carbonyl carbon over here on the left-hand side of that, of that carboxylic acid, and we use that as the one carbon and count two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And if we, if we had to name it, that's the UPAC way of naming it. Now, with the, the omega way of naming it, now it's not a name specifically because a name describes the entire structure. The omega uh, designation ju is, is just an indicator, a very slight structural indicator that tells us, well, we might be dealing with essential amino acids. It does not give a whole lot of information as to the entire structure of a molecule. Now, uh, in certain terminologies, uh, the first uh, the first hydrocarbon type carbon in a uh, in, in a carboxylic acid, look over here on the left, would be considered uh, the alpha carbon because it is alpha right next door to the carbonyl carbon. And we go alpha, beta, gamma, delta. That's one way of doing it. We actually didn't look at uh, at, uh, at that method, but that that is a way of doing it. Omega nomenclature, I had to say that because what it does is it turns it, to, it flips the script, it turns it on its head. Look to the other end of the molecule, over on the right hand side, the last carbon on that molecule. It is the last one, so it is the omega carbon. Uh, omega is the, is, uh, is the, the end of the, or towards the end of the Greek alphabet, so it is considered, omega is considered the end carbon the methyl end, if you will, on a carboxylic acid. So to get into omega type uh, uh, designation, the molecule that we're looking at right here, um, <clears throat> to, what, to find out whether it's an omega-3 or an omega-6, we have to count inward from that omega carbon till we encounter the first carbon of the first double bond. So here we go, one, two, three, four five and six. There's that first carbon, the first double bond in there. So this is indeed an omega-6 fatty acid. Notice it does, gives no indication whatsoever as to the number of carbons in the molecule. Uh, it gives no indication as to how many uh, double bonds we have in that mo molecule and their positions in there. None of that. All it gives is a very slight structural uh, indication of, uh, of, of the type of molecule you're probably dealing with. If it's an omega-6 fatty acid, chances are it's an essential fatty acid. So we can, you know, knowing this, we can, I can give you any number of these sorts of things. Uh, you know, if, if, if I said, okay, which is the omega-3, which is the omega-6, we'll pretend the designations aren't right there. We would just look, here's a fatty acid, it's unsaturated, has to be unsaturated, obviously, to count inward to a double bond. And if we look at this first one up top here, there is the omega carbon on the, on the right-hand side, one, two, three carbons before we encounter that first carbon of, the, of that uh, first double bond. So that's a representative omega-3 fatty acid. The one down on the bottom, there's the omega carbon, that last carbon we count in, two, three, four, five, and six until we encounter that, uh, uh, that uh, first double bond carbon, a representative omega-6 fatty acid. Understand, there can be innumerable, very large number of uh, omega-3 fatty acids that, that, that are very different in structure. Similarly, there can be a huge number of omega-6 fatty acids. That's not what we're interested in, specific naming. What we're interested in is just designating these. What's omega-3, what's omega-6, and if they're either, they're probably an essential fatty acid.